It is great to be with you. I always love coming home to Williams. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I am the coordinator of the Alabama Cooperative Baptist Fellowship, one of, and help serve about 30 churches across our state, you guys being one of them. And I just wanted to spend a couple of moments before I begin my sermon today to thank you and remind you of the ways that we are connected. You guys um, give to us. We partner together in lots of mission opportunities across our state. And recently, several of our churches from other places joined you guys after our most recent tornadoes and um, worked to clear some yards together. I love the opportunity to do that because you get to really know people when you're all looking your worst and eating turkey sandwiches out of the back of a pickup truck. So um, it's a good, good moment. But also we had the opportunity last month to honor our friend Bob Ford, who I dearly love and who has made such a difference across our state. Many of you were there on the evening that we honored him as one of the people who've paved a path of legacy, a, of ministry across the state of Alabama and have touched the lives of so many people who are now in ministry. Um, it's just amazing the dozens of people who have been um, understood their call from God because of the impact that Bob Ford has had on, his, on their lives. And coming up this fall, we have Barry Howard, who is going to preach for us at our fall gathering in Birmingham in October. And I was having lunch with him a few weeks ago, and we talked about the legacy of love that comes from this place in Jacksonville. And I know that your motto is Jacksonville Strong, and I believe it. And it is so easy to see the way that you love Jesus, and that impacts the way you love others, and it makes such a huge difference. And I am delighted to partner with you in the ministry that you're doing in this place and across our state. I will be um, offering you a confession at this moment, and that is that yesterday I talked to Nikki on the phone. Um, we normally follow what is called the lectionary calendar, which gives us scripture verses to preach from. And the lectionary calendar scripture for today was a story about the life of Peter. And then I talked to Nikki on the phone, and she reminded me that it was graduate day. And I decided to switch my sermon. And this is for you, but also for all of you, because I think there is a lot to learn about being in a place of going a new direction. So we're going to back up the story of Peter to the very beginning. And I want to read to you this passage that comes to us from Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 through 22. If you want to open your Bibles and follow along with me. Our scripture from Matthew 4 says, As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers. Simon, who would later be called Peter, and his brother Andrew. And they were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come and follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. And at once they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John. And they were in a boat with their father Zebedee, repairing their nets, and Jesus called them. And immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Would you pray with me? God, we are so honored to know that when we gather together, that you have told us that you are with us. That's an amazing gift to know. So we thank you for being present with us. Open our hearts and our minds to hear something new from you this day. In the name of Jesus, who calls every one of us, we offer this prayer. 
Amen. Today, our story begins with Jesus calling his very first disciples. In Matthew's story, we find Jesus walking along the shore, and he sees Simon and his brother Andrew casting their nets for fish. Jesus calls out to them and invites them to come and follow him, and at once they leave their nets and their boats, and they follow Jesus. Jesus also sees two other brothers, James and John. The Bible tells us that they are the sons of Zebedee and that Zebedee is with them. And he calls to them and invites them to follow him. And they leave and follow Jesus. Now, does anyone notice anything strange about this story? Simon and Andrew, James and John, dropping their nets, leaving their boats and their father. Why? What makes someone walk away from their life? When you were young, what did you want to be when you grew up? I wanted to be a singer. Bethany, I did not make it. (laughs) um, I'm a mom of two young adult children, And when my son was in middle school, there's that day in the counselor's office where they call you into middle school because the counselors have talked to your children and taken a survey about what they think they want to do, and that's going to impact the classes they take in high school. So then they have a parent conference. And so um, my son, I'm just going to say he's brilliant, really smart. And um, so we were expecting great things from him. And so we walked into the counselor's office, and she immediately starts giggling. And we're like, okay, so what's up? Tell us what your conversation with Turner led you to know. And she said, well, he's got great ambition. He filled out on his form that he intends to be a famous rock guitarist until the day that he becomes a successful author. (laughs) I was like, yeah, we're reaching for the stars. We all have dreams about who we wanted to be, where we thought we might end up. For some of you, it may have been a farmer or a doctor or a teacher or a singer. But you know what it was for those kids back in Jesus' day? They wanted to be a rabbi. That was the top of the line for them. They wanted to grow up to be rabbis. And from the time they were very tiny, they started learning the law. They would all go to school together, boys and girls. They would would sit. They would learn the scriptures from the letter of the law. And as they traveled onward, fewer and fewer people got to go along that path. There came a day, girls, when, sorry, at that time, the girls were just sent home to study with their moms, to learn how to be good wives and mothers, and the boys stayed in school. And the boys desired most of all to follow a rabbi, the most respected person in the town. And so they would learn and study, they would recite, they would memorize. And, you know, we've seen the picture of Jesus at the age of 13 when it says he went to the temple and was asking questions of all of the scholars there, and they were amazed by all he had learned. Every boy had that opportunity. And at some point, you either kept going or you were sent home to learn the trade of your father. At some point, someone said, you're not quite good enough, so go home and learn the trade of your father. Just simply not enough. But the ones who kept going Eventually, the star student would have a rabbi come to them and say, I've seen you. I've seen all of your gifts and talents, 
and I want to invite you to follow me. And at that time, that boy would leave his parents' home, and he would follow, and I mean absolutely follow in the steps of a rabbi, a few steps behind, wherever the rabbi would go. If the rabbi stopped to wash his hands, then the student stopped and washed their hands. If the rabbi stopped to eat lunch, then the student stopped to eat lunch. And every time the rabbi sat, the student knew that they were going to be learning. But also in the town, everyone knew, look at the one who's following the rabbi. He was the best. So why does someone walk away from their life, from their boats, from their fish, from their father? Because finally, finally, they were good enough. The rabbi came and said, follow me, and there's not a question of what you do. You get up and you follow the rabbi. Zebedee went home that day and said, Mama, the boys are not coming home for dinner. And she's like, where are the boys? The rabbi came, and the boys have followed. That's why you walk away. Because someone important sees you and everything you have to offer and says, I believe in you. Follow me. So there's a, a really famous um, author now who started out as a, well, she is, a social worker, researcher, Brene Brown. Some of you may have read some of her books. I love them. Who studied for decades the effect that difficult emotions like shame, fear, and vulnerability have on human behavior. And the more research she did, the more she began to see patterns unfold. She began to see that overall people dealt with the effects of shame in two very different ways. There were stories of people who suffered from shame and they responded with exhaustion, judgment, numbing, and scarcity. And then there were the stories of the people who moved beyond shame with gratitude, compassion, hope, authenticity, and love. And when she compared the two, there was one component that made the difference in the two ways that people responded. What made the difference was that the people who lived wholeheartedly were those who believed that they were worthy of love and belonging. In her book, The Gifts of Imperfection, Brene says that wholehearted living is about engaging in our lives from a place of worthiness, learning that we are enough. You know, in the Bible, we often, especially in the four Gospels, we often get the same story from different points of view. So we have the same story that we read earlier from Matthew in the Gospel of Luke, but it's a bigger story. Um, with a lot more detail. So I'm going to read it to you quickly. Once, when he was standing on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, the crowd was pushing in on Jesus to better hear his words. And he noticed two boats tied up. The fishermen had just left them and were scrubbing out their nets. And he climbed into the boat that was Simon's and asked him to put out a little from shore. Sitting there, using the boat for a pulpit, he taught the crowd. And when he finished teaching, he said to Simon, Push out into deep water and let your nets out for a catch. And Simon said, Master, we've been fishing hard all night and haven't caught even a minnow. But if you say so... I'll push out one more time and let out the nets. And it was no sooner said than done, and a huge haul of fish, straining the nets past capacity, was captured. And they waved to their partners in the other boat, James and John, to come and help them. And they filled both boats, nearly swamping them with the catch. And Simon Peter, when he saw it, fell to his knees before Jesus 
and said, Master, leave me. I am a sinner, and I cannot even begin to handle your holiness. So leave me to myself. And when they pulled in that catch of fish, all overwhelmed Simon and everyone with him. And it was the same with James and John, Zebedee's sons, who were co-workers of Simon. And Jesus turned and looked at Simon and said, Simon, there is nothing to fear. From now on, you will continue to fish, but you will fish for men and women. Follow me. And they pulled their boats onto the beach, and they left the boats, the nets, and all of those fish, and followed Jesus. When we feel like we've never been enough, then fear takes its place. Face to face with the holiness of the rabbi, Simon is filled with fear. That feeling of once again not measuring up. But Jesus encourages Peter, don't be 